Good morning, everybody. It's good to have you join us this morning here, Edmonton Baptist Church. Uh, once again, we're quite a small team here in the building, uh, just uh, six of us bringing you this service this morning. But it, it's great to be sharing right out there into the world. One of the things we're learning through COVID is that the church and its message is not to be locked up inside the doors of any building but that that message belongs to the whole world. And so we're really privileged to be able to be broadcasting this service and have you join with us this morning. So I pray that you'll open your hearts to God's Holy Spirit and every part of this service will be both glorifying to him and a tremendous blessing to you. Uh, If you are an uh, Edmonton Baptist Church member, a special welcome to you as well. We haven't forgotten you. We pray for you regularly. So please... uh, enjoy our service together this morning. He's kept us through another week and we're here to worship him and to honour him for all his goodness to us. Uh, I will add one notice this morning that in the last part of our service today I will be sharing the communion meal which is rather strange when you're separated by sometimes many miles but uh, I would like to say that you can share in your home this communion with us. If you might like to go now and get some bread and some kind of drink to share with us, and when we get to that part of the service where we share communion, I will give you the instructions on when to eat the bread and when to drink your drink together, and the Lord will be with us. Amen. So we're going to start now by praying and asking God to come and fill our hearts this morning. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we know that you are in every place, at every time, in every location. Whatever nation is watching and sharing this service this morning, you are as much there as you are here with us in this church building in Edmonton. But we pray this prayer just to welcome you and to make our own hearts open, set to receive you and to to be aware of your presence because that presence is healing, that presence is encouragement, that presence is challenge, that presence is a wonderful warmth of affection and physically we have missed that so much with other human beings but Lord by your intervention you can hug us with your Holy Spirit hug this morning. And we can know a Father's love in that intimate and precious way. So may our worship this morning be glorifying to you. We give you our thanks for all your goodness to us. Whatever our circumstances, every day has been a blessing from you. We acknowledge that and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. We're just going to read a few verses from Psalm 121. I lift my eyes up to the mountains. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. He will not let your foot slip. He who watches over you will not slumber. Indeed, he who watches over Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord watches over you. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun will not harm you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all harm, and he will watch over your life. The Lord will watch over your coming and going, both now and forevermore. Amen. Amen. We're going to start our worship song this morning with a song from our friends Resound Worship. Jesus, you call us, this is our communion. Jesus, you call. 
Amen. Amen. Shall we pray? We're going to bring our prayers for the world. Almighty God, we're glad to call you Almighty God because we know that often when we think things in our lives or in the world are out of control, we need to be reminded that you are still the God who created this world. You are still the God who sustains the very breath that we breathe. And we know that nothing is out of your control, that your plans and purposes are still moving forward to the place that you intend them to conclude in that renewed kingdom of heaven that is prepared for those who love you. So give us encouragement and give us peace in our hearts, even in the middle of a storm. But Lord, we offer you our world today, Lord. As we look around the world, we see so many kinds of trouble and darkness and chaos. <coughs> and we ask you, Lord, to go to that country of Indonesia this morning where there has been a massive earthquake. And we pray, Lord, that you will bring the people there the help that they need quickly and swiftly. We pray too, Lord, for those who have lost loved ones. Lord, that although we hear numbers that have died in these crisis around the world. Lord, we forget sometimes that each one of those people who has passed away has families that love them. And Lord, we just want to pray for your encouragement to go to those who are at this point in grief and mourning. 
Lord, we pray for those who've lost their homes in this earthquake. Lord, that help will come to them soon to restore them safe places to live together. Lord, we pray for the country of Yemen at this time, Lord, that doesn't seem to get into our news very often because of political reasons. And Lord, we know that this is the biggest humanitarian crisis in our world right now where 12 million people are suffering extreme poverty, where children are starving for lack of food and medical care. Lord, we pray that political leaders involved in any way in this conflict, Lord, will challenge one another to end this crisis, bring peace and stability to that country. And we pray that humanitarian aid will find its way to those who desperately need it at this time. We pray for the country of Uganda, Lord, currently experiencing the aftermath of elections. And we do pray, Lord, for peace. We know that this election is already being contested. And uh, we pray, Lord, that uh, the result of that will not be violence on the streets. Lord, we pray for all the nations of the world where there is conflict over leadership, that there may be peace, that citizens will so want to live in peace that they will find ways of reconciling their differences. Lord, we pray for that great country of America, Lord, those United States. We pray there that the chaos we've seen recently, Lord, might turn to order. Uh, we pray that peace will reign. The pictures we've seen of the National Guard protecting the very heart of the democracy in America. Lord, we pray that there will not be violence and intimidation as this election, this inauguration of the new president begins. Lord, we pray that your sovereign will will be done in that nation, as in every nation of the world. <coughs> Lord, bring peace, we pray. We pray for our church here in Edmonton, Lord. You know our struggles to be able to embrace one another, to look after each one another when we're separated and news is hard to hear sometimes. And we pray particularly for Irene King in hospital, Lord. And we ask, Lord, that in your mercy, you will come to her with a new vision of who you are. And physically, Lord, we pray you'll keep her from pain and strengthen her body. We pray for our brother Winston Grant, who has been so poorly in hospital and remains there. We thank you, Lord, that our prayers are being heard and there is optimism and improvement today. We thank you for that. May that continue because for all the doctors can do technically, you are the one that makes those interventions effective because you are the healer. So heal our brother Winston Grant. We ask in your mercy, we pray that you might give him back to his family and to us. But Lord, we pray too for those families who suffered bereavement in recent months, some from the COVID virus, others from unrelated things. Lord, please draw close to those who grieve. And those who have put their trust in you, Lord Jesus, might find this to be their comfort and encouragement, <laughs> their sure and certain hope that Jesus, although he died, rose again and opened a way up for life to continue beyond this life for those that love you. Lord, we offer up all these prayers to you now. And we know, Lord, that we are at your mercy, but we pray, Lord, you might yet remove this COVID virus from our world. Lord, forgive us that we have sinned and we need to repent of our sin, not just individually, but as nations and as, a, as your people, your creatures. And Lord, in your mercy, bring us to a better place, we pray. All this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now we're going to sing a song now, How Deep the Father's Love.
beautiful song that is how deep the father's love uh, god has not abandoned us in any of the circumstances that we go through life uh, his love is so deep that he sent jesus to be the remedy for our sin and our rebellion and uh, today we focus entirely around the cross and the sacrifice of god's son jesus our savior and andrew is going to come now and present to us another country to pray for through our flag. Good morning, everyone. So we look to the next country on our list, and I dressed appropriately with the dress from that country. So we look today to Nigeria. Nigeria's flag has a very simple design, but it has significant meaning behind the design. The green bands are designed to represent the natural wealth of the nation, while the white band was designed to represent peace. Nigeria is bordered to the north by Niger, to the east by Chad and Cameroon, to the south by the Gulf of Guinea of the Atlantic Ocean, and to the west by Benin. Nigeria is not only, the, not only large in area, but also Africa's most populous country. Nigeria has a tropical climate with variable rainy and dry seasons, depending on location. It is hot and wet, and wet most of the year in the southwest, but dry in the southwest and fa uh, farther island. In the south, the rainy season lasts from March to November, whereas in the far north, it lasts only from mid-May to September. The population of Nigeria, 190 million, the economy of Nigeria is a middle-income mixed economy and emerging market with expanding manufacturing, financial service, communication technology, and entertainment sectors. Nigeria has the largest economy in Africa. Its re-emergent manufacturing sector became the largest on the continent in 2013. The United Kingdom is Nigeria's largest trading partner, followed by the United States. Nigeria's foreign economy relations revolve around its role in supplying the world economy with oil and natural gas. Religion in Nigeria, when I first time saw it, I thought that I cannot see the numbers correctly, so I was checking for religion in Nigeria a few times. 
but it still came the same that 50% are Muslims, 40% Christians, and 10% other religions. Nigeria is home to a large majority of West African evangelicals, about 95 million claim Christianity. The Nigerian church has sent over 5,000 Christian missionaries throughout the country and overseas. But the nation is largely divided between the predominantly Muslim North and Christian South. Although 40% claim Christianity, believers in the North have suffered decades of persecution, including the destruction of thousands of churches. Even so, Muslim, 50% of the population, are being drawn to Jesus and the church has experienced substantial growth. Yet, lack of discipleship second-generation nominalism, syncretism, tribal and dominational divisions, materialism and immor immorality all threaten the body of Christ. The false teaching of the prosperity gospel are also rampant. About 10% of Nigeria's people group remain enriched, many of which are being rapidly Islamized. Nigeria has many natural landmarks and wildlife reserves. Protected areas such as Cross River National Park and Yankari National Park have waterfalls, dense rainforests, savanna, and rare primate habitats. One of the most recognizable, recognizable sites in Zuma, is Zuma Rock, a 725-meter tall monolith outside the capital of Abuja that's pictured on the national currency. Mangroves and tropical forests in the south, savanna, savanna and grassland in the north, and wet, wetlands along the coast parallel this diversity. Buildings, we have here some pictures of Abuja, Lagos, and Uyo, some of the major cities in Nigeria. Traditional clothing, Nigeria is Africa's most populous country. There are numerous tribes and ethnic groups many of which wear their own style of garb. Taking in consideration that there are a few hundreds, it was quite hard to find uh, a few photos to represent all of them. Some interesting facts. As Africa's most populous country, Nigeria represents 2.4% of the global population. Their rich diversity is beautifully represented in 544 people groups. 7% of the total languages spoken in the world are spoken in Nigeria. I believe that if they will not speak English, they couldn't, couldn't understand each other. It is thought that the area surrounding Calabar has the world's most diverse species of butterfly. The country's film industry, known as Nollywood, is one of the largest film producers in the world, second only to India's Bollywood. West Africa's oldest civilization, the Na, have been in the country since 1000 BC. Nigeria is the second, uh, the 12th largest producer of crude oil, pushing out over 2.5 million barrels per day. And some prayer points. To pray for dismantling of widespread corruption which crippled all levels of society, especially the government and including the church to pray for an emphasis on discipleship and balanced Bible teaching in the Nigerian church, which continues to experience massive growth, but whose teaching is often syncretistic and prosperity-based. Pray for increasingly persecuted Christian in Islamized northern states to be characterized by supernatural love and forgiveness. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for Nigeria, Father, and we thank you, Father, for for the, the beautiful place that you, you show us once again that you have created, Father. There is no place we look in this world to not see the beauty of the nature, Father. But in the same time, we see that we as humans, Father, we are not good stewards all the time of what you gave us. Father, we pray, Father, against corruption, Father. We pray, Father, against, against uh, wrong teachings, Father. And we pray, Father, that you will use this nation, you will use the 40% of Christians, so many millions of Christians in this country, that they indeed look at you, Father, like their Lord and Savior, and to put you for the, uh, on the first place in their life, not what you give them, Father. 
to seek the giver, not the gift, Father. You want all of us to have a good life, Father, but, in the, but you want us more than anything to seek first your kingdom, Father. So we pray, Father, against corruption. We pray against the false teaching. And Father, also pray, Father, against the Islamic, Islamic threat for the Christianity, Father. We pray security, Father, over, over, over the Christians. And most of all, Father, we pray, Father, for a change of hearts, Father, of those who think that killing others for your name's sake is wise. Father, we pray, Father, that they will know you and your Son as their Lord and Savior, and they will have a change of heart. We thank you, Father, for Nigeria. We thank you for the people in Nigeria. We thank you for this country, Father. And we pray the blood of Jesus over them. And we pray, Father, a change, Father, in their government, a change in their church, for the best and for the good of your serving. Amen. Thank you, uh, Andrea. And of course, uh, we have seen the crisis in uh, northern Nigeria quite often recently on our television screens. And Hebrews 12, again to find verses these, 14 to 24. Uh, those who would destroy the Make line every effort to... ...would face uh, justice that is due to them. Uh, I'm just going to pray for a moment to thank God for the provision that he has made for us. Heavenly Father, we thank you every day for what you have given us. But also, Lord, we thank you that all that you've given us belongs to you. And I thank you, Lord, for the generosity of so many people in churches across the world and in our own church here at Edmonton, Lord, that they are continuing to give their offerings as a sign and mark of their love and commitment to you and to your church. And Lord, we pray a blessing on every amount of offering that has been given, Lord, that it will be used for good purposes, for the strengthening and the spreading of your gospel, because we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Our reading today is going to be read to us by Richard uh, Dunkley. Thank you. Every effort to live in peace with all men and to be holy. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. See to it that no one misses the grace of God and that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. See that no one is sexually immoral or is godless like Esau, who for a single meal sold his inheritance rights as the oldest son. Afterwards, as you know, when he wanted to inherit this blessing, he was rejected. He could bring about no change of mind, though he sought the blessing with tears. You have not come to a mountain that can be touched and that is burning with fire, to darkness, gloom and storm, to a trumpet blast or to such a voice speaking words that those who heard it begged that no further word be spoken to them. Because they could not bear what was commanded, if even an animal touches the mountain, it must be stoned. The, the, the sight was so terrifying that Moses said, I am trembling with fear. But you have come to Mount Zion, to the heavenly Jerusalem, the city of the living God. You have come to thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful assembly to the church of the firstborn, whose names are written in heaven, you have come to God, the judge of all men, to the spirits of righteous men made perfect, to Jesus the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. Thanks be to God for his word. And we're going to be looking now at those verses from Hebrews chapter 12, and uh, it's actually the whole of the rest of chapter 12 from verses 13 to 29. And I've entitled our thoughts today as From Fear to Joy, From Fear to Joy. So we continue in Hebrews chapter 12 from verse 13, and that chapter, that part of the chapter begins with very practical instructions that remind us how we should be living if we claim to be Christian. Do you claim to be a Christian today? 
Do you claim the name of Jesus? Well, we're told here very practically, be at peace with everyone. Seek to live a holy and a blameless life, the scripture says. But why, why is this so important, that we live at peace with everyone, that we seek to live this holy life? Why is that so important? Well, the writer tells us, because without it, no one will see the Lord. We would love to be able to tell people out there who are not yet Christians, well, don't look to us, we're not perfect, look to Jesus, which is, of course, ultimately true. But the fact and the actual reality of life is that people will look to those who claim to be Christians and they will make an assessment of who Jesus is by what they see in our lives. And the writer here is very succinct. Without holiness, without a life that matches our confession of faith, then no one will see the Lord. We're actually putting some people off. This is a tremendous responsibility, isn't it? People will be looking at us and they will be asking whether there is anything in us that suggests that it is worth following this man, this saviour called Jesus. Um, I believe from having conversations with Muslims over the years that when people came from other nations and nations with other beliefs and religious systems, when they came to this country, they were under the impression that Britain was a Christian country. There are still some people now who believe that Britain is a Christian country and that all white British people must be Christians, therefore. But when incomers came to this country and they saw the way that our nation lives, why would anyone become a Christian if this is what it results in? Our lives were no different from anyone else's lives. And this was a negative witness. And so the writer of this letter to the Hebrew Christians says, live the way that points people to Jesus. And this is a big responsibility. So if you claim to have faith in Christ, then people should see something of Christ in you that encourages them to inquire about him for themselves. It might be somebody you work with, it might be your neighbours, it might be your extended family. There might be so many places where you meet other people. But does your life point people to Jesus or does it turn them away from Christ? Uh, you will know, and I, at the moment I can't help myself but include this in my thinking and preaching, you will know if you've been following our services recently, how despairing I am concerning the Christianity that is coming out of America. And I'm not going to apologize for saying this again. So much of what I see coming out of America bears little relationship to the Christ of the Gospels. And so many Christians in this country are willingly following the lead of those who call themselves Christians in America. And I want to ask the question, do our lives match what we claim to be in Christ. It doesn't matter what nation we come from or what our background is, if we claim the name of Jesus, do our lives match the testimony of our lips? It says here, believers will be judged first. That's quite shocking. If you're a Christian and you regularly go to church, you might think, well, of course, God's going to judge all the people who aren't Christians first and because he loves us. But in fact, the scripture says, we as Christians are going to be judged first by God to see if our lives have backed up the testimony of our lips. We have tasted the grace of God, so we are under more responsibility than the world that as yet has not heard or grasped the gospel. Verse 15 says, Let no one become like a bitter plant that grows up and causes many troubles with its poison. Now again, it's good to remember that the writer of these words was addressing Christians who were in the church, the early church. He's not speaking to the world directly when he says this. And in these days, internal divisions in our churches are breaking out more and more frequently wherever you look. It's like wildfires that are causing unknown harm, but it should not be. 
among the people who call themselves Christian. This letter, we know, was written to Jewish believers who had put their faith in Jesus as their Messiah. But they were on the point of turning away. You've heard us say that a number of times recently. They were thinking that this cost of following Christ was too demanding and too painful. And they were thinking of going back into the safety of their old Jewish upbringing and religious practices. But you know, one of the things that we see in these verses that we have lost in these times, specifically in the Western church, is any real sense of the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord. Now, the talk at the moment in every nation is, we fear COVID. People are very anxious, they're frightened. They've seen people that they love pass away. If we fear COVID in these days, then we should fear God infinitely more than anything that comes against us. James chapter 2, verse 19 says, You believe that God is one, you do well to do that, but even the demons believe that and they tremble. The enemies of God tremble before him because they know who he is, they know his power. <laughs> but so often as Christians, we don't tremble anymore. We've made God so nice that we don't think he would ever do anything except always hug us and cuddle us and agree with everything that we do. Anything goes is the maxim of these days. No one can tell me what to do. The world has infected the church and we're paying a very heavy price for that. And these Jewish believers, they knew about the fear of God it was passed down to them through the generations, right back to the exodus from Egypt. The story was passed on from generation to generation in their families, and still is. They knew about the fear of God, verses 18 to 21. Then when Moses brought the people physically close to Mount Sinai in those days, as God had summoned them, this fear became tangible. Blazing fire, it says, darkness and gloom, storm, the blast of the trumpet, and then the sound of a voice. And the voice was such that they begged not to hear any more because the voice said, if even an animal touches the mountain, it must be killed. I can't hear this anymore. They were in fear of God. And even Moses, were told, trembled. Despite those experiences, it only caused a temporary change in the behavior of God's people. And if you look back over the Old Testament period, time and time again, God showed his mercy and grace. And yes, we repent of sin, and then a little while later, they were back doing the same things they always did. But at least they knew that in the past, their people had a fear of God, of who he was. But says the writer to these new Jewish believers in Christ, as you remember the old covenant that your forefathers lived under, remember something amazing now. Because now, because of Christ, there is a new covenant which brings not fear and terror, but joy. There was on the one hand, we're told, the physical terror of Mount Sinai, and that now has changed to the joyful anticipation of Mount Zion, the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem that is being prepared for those who have truly given their hearts and lives and allegiance to Jesus, whose names are written in God's book of life. And it isn't that we any more deserve the blessing than those people in ancient times. Romans chapter 3, verse 23 is key to every single one of us, whether we claim to be Christians or not. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That's you, that's me. That's where we're starting from. We're helpless before God. And yet verse 24 says, it is because of Jesus who gave his life on the cross for our disobedience and sin. Verse 24, you have come to Jesus who arranged the new covenant and to the sprinkled blood that promises much better things than does the blood of Abel. We're sharing that in our communion together in a few minutes. That's why Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. Never forget this wonderful new covenant that God prepared for you through the sacrifice of his son. Because it's a covenant that is centered on joy and anticipation 
of what he's prepared for us. Once there was fear under that old covenant at the thought of coming near to God and meeting with that almighty power. Now the writer of Hebrews says we can come boldly and with confidence into our Father's presence. I don't know what kind of uh, fathers you've had. Some of you may not even know who your fathers were. May God bless you to discover the wonderful fatherhood of God. My mother used to tell me that her father was a a Victorian preacher with a three-quarter length coat and big white tails that he used to wear, showing that he was a, a Methodist minister. But the interesting thing was, she said, I was only ever called into his study when I had done something wrong. And I thought, how sad that is, the picture we have of a father who only wants to see his children to tell them off or to show them where they were wrong. We don't live in fear under the old covenant, though we should have a reverence and fear for who God is. But we live under a new covenant through Jesus, his son, that is the anticipation of joy, the things that God has prepared for us. Not that we deserve it any better than them, but God in his mercy and love has given us that opportunity to come close to him boldly and to call him Father, Abba, in that wonderful way. Hebrews uh, chapter 10 reminds us of that. Hebrews 10 verses 19 to 22 says, We have come then, my brothers and sisters, complete freedom we have to go into the most holy place by means of the death of Jesus, For he opened for us a new way, a living way through the curtain that is through his own body. We have a great high priest in charge of the house of God. So let us come near to God with a sincere heart and a sure faith, with hearts that have been purified from a guilty conscience and with bodies washed with clean water. There's that wonderful sense of joy that through Jesus, although God is awesome and all-powerful, that we can come boldly into our Father's presence and know and experience his love. And that is amazing grace, isn't it, that God has poured out for us through Christ. But surely this is even more, the writer says, even more reason to live lives worthy of his love, because God has not changed. He is still the awesome, almighty, powerful God. Verse 25 warns us not to take his grace and mercy lightly, not to presume upon his love. It says, be careful then and do not refuse to hear him who speaks. God has not changed. But the way that God has mediated and shown his love for us through Jesus' son changes everything. Verse 26 to 27, God shook the earth at that time in the past, but we hear are told that God will shake not only the earth, but also the heaven as well. That's verse 27. The old covenant was characterized by tangible fear. The new covenant that we're sharing in the blood of Christ today again through the communion. The new covenant comes by joy because the future God has prepared for those who love and obey him can never be shaken. What a wonderful message of encouragement. Everything in this world will be shaken and removed. We're told that. COVID is reminding us how fragile everything is in this world. We thought we could just go about our business and we could conquer anything that came against us. Suddenly the whole world is on its knees. Families are suffering the experiences of COVID. COVID is reminding us how fragile everything is in this world. Our world, our normal, is being shaken. So as we remember the sacrifice Jesus made for us on the cross through the sharing of this communion meal in a moment, let us be thankful, joyful, grateful and humble. And may our lives bear a testimony that points other people to Jesus. Amen. We're going to sing another song as we prepare our hearts to share this communion together. And the song is called, once again, Jesus Christ, I think upon your sacrifice. We'll sing this together.
song we we praise God for the truth of those words Jesus laid down his life as a sacrifice to his father so that we might have a place in heaven so I encourage you to open your hearts as we share this communion together now and if we do that I believe that God will visit you wherever you are I pray as well that as we share this communion, he might put his hand of healing on some of you who are watching this service today. I pray that some of you who are struggling financially, that God will make a way for you to have all that you need at this difficult time. But most of all, I pray that you'll open your heart and receive Jesus as your saviour, if you've never done that before. I pray the Holy Spirit will bring bread and wine alive to you. 
today and that his blessing will be tangible on your life. Just to remind you, if you're watching from home, you can share in this communion. I hope that you have got bread together and some kind of drink, and I will tell you when to eat and drink those things as we come through our communion. <coughs> and I invite my colleague, uh, Pastor William, to come and uh, to share for a moment with us. So I offer this invitation to all of you who are listening this morning. Come to this sacred table, not because you must, but because you may. Come not to testify that you are righteous and good, but that you sincerely love our Lord Jesus Christ and desire to be his true disciples. Come not because you are strong, but because you are weak, not because you have any claim on heaven's rewards, but because in your frailty and sin, you stand in constant need of heaven's mercy and help. But Jesus said, come to me, all of you who are tired from carrying heavy loads, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke and put it on you and learn from me, because I am gentle and humble in spirit, and in me you will find rest. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that you were prepared to come down from the wonders and glory of heaven, the very presence of your Father, to stoop down to this world and go through the life of a human being with all its struggles and to end giving your life on that cross, which cost you so much. We thank you that you were willing to do that for us. May we willingly now open our hearts to you, receive you, and follow you in our lives. Amen. For I received from the Lord what I also deliver to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way also the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. body of Christ broken for you. Please share the bread together at home, saying these words, the body of Christ broken for you. My Jesus, I love thee. I know thou art mine, for thee all the follies of sin I resign. My gracious Redeemer, my Saviour art thou. If ever I love thee, my Jesus is now. If you'd like to get your drink at home and we're going to share this wine together, the blood of Christ shed for you for the forgiveness of sin.
Lord, in this moment we remember your amazing grace. Touch every heart, every life. That we might experience that grace, not just hear about it, experience it. And when we go from this place this morning, when we go from our homes, Lord, that we might share that love that we've experienced from you with a lost world that needs this message of salvation so desperately. Thank you for feeding us this morning with your body and your blood. And so go forth into the world in peace. Be of good courage. Hold fast to that which is good. Render to no man evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak. Help the afflicted. Honor all men. Love and serve the Lord, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. And now the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and fill you with his peace today and always. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. God bless you. Have a good week.